Well, hello there. This time I thought I'd take a look at the method feeder for bream. It's a simple tactic, but there's a few little tips I can show you which will hopefully help you put more fish on the bank. So if you like these videos, please hit the subscribe button and give us a thumbs up. Let's have a look at how we tie the rig first. So when I'm fishing for bigger bream, chances are I'm not going to want to be recasting all that regularly. So I want to pack quite a lot of bait around the feeder. And these, uh, I suppose, quite old-fashioned style trilobe feeders are ideal for that because you can pack more bait on than you can with the modern flat feeders. Now, originally I used the Richworth uh, trilobe feeders from, from donkeys years ago, and they were absolutely brilliant, perfect for the job, really. But I believe they're not available anymore, and I've, my supplies have uh, gradually run out in the, over the years. So I had to find a different feeder that would do the job that I wanted it to do. And the one I came up with in the end was this Fox one, which is what I like about it is it's got the weight evenly distributed along the length of the body, actually built into two of these veins. And that means nine times out of ten it will come to rest the right way up on the bottom. And because the weight's along the body, it won't sit nose down. It will tend to come and come to rest fairly flat, which is ideal. You're not then going to cause any strange angles on the hook length where it exits the feeder. So I want it to land the right way up and I want it to land flat even if the bottom's fairly soft. And then I'm just going to pack ground bait around it and we'll look at the, some of the ground bait mixes later. But that's the general feeder setup I'm looking for. And really the rig is pretty simple but we'll have a look at that next. Well the rig we're going to be using is pretty simple. It's really just a hair rig and, and very simple to tie. And I'll just tweak it very slightly through experience really of bream fishing over the years just to make it slightly more effective. So I'm going to start off with a length probably about 14 inches of 8 pound fluorocarbon and make sure it's pure fluorocarbon and just pull it out just to take some of the, the coiling out of it and straighten it out and then we'll cut a piece of that off and I'll start off because I'm going to be fishing a hair rig I'm going to start off just by tying a small loop in the end. There we go. And I normally just use the end of the scissors to carefully just tighten that knot up. So I'm looking for a loop that's about eight millimeters or so in size. Now at this point I need to put my glasses on and what I like to do is put the bait on the hair before I tie the hook on and that just allows me to get the length of the hair absolutely perfect. So I'm going to start off today with one of these 12 mil wafters, which is uh, one of the baits. We'll talk a bit more about baits later, but one of the baits that I use on the hook. And then I'll just put that onto the hook length. There we go. Grab a stop. And fix that in place. So what I've got is just the bait on that loop on the length of line and that will allow me just to get the length of the hair absolutely spot on. So I'm going to be using one of my pretty standard really Nash Fang X hooks in a size 10. I use these for a lot of feeder rigs with bigger baits. Good hook, very very sharp and a nice curved shank which gives it quite an aggressive uh, angle and uh, means you hook a lot of fish. And what I like to do is have the bait sitting just below the bend of the hook. Just leave a couple of millimetres there really, not too far. And then I'll make ten turns, five, six, down the shank of the hook. Back through the eye. There we go, just to form that knotless knot. So it's a very, very simple rig to tie. If you can tie a knotless knot, that's all you're looking for, really. And the key thing to remember is just to get the length of that hair right so the bait's sitting a little bit below the bend of the hook. And with that uh, slightly curved shank of the hook, you'll see that the hook actually sits a little bit away from it. And because of the stiffish nature of the fluorocarbon, it creates an even more aggressive angle where it's going to catch straight away when a fish moves off and uh, fills the weight of the feeder. And at the other end of the hook length, all I'm going to do is attach 
a rig swivel that's the right size to fit into the feeder and semi-fix in place. Now you could use a four-turn grinner knot to attach the swivel or even a blood knot but um, because I like to have a bit of three movement at that end of the hook length just so it lies a bit flatter what I'm going to do is tie it on using a figure of eight loop knot and that's dead easy to tie. I'm just going to make a loop there in the end of the hook length come round the loop with the, with the swivel and then put the swivel through the loop and then carefully pull that down make sure I wet it and then pull it carefully tight make sure you pull both ends of the knot just to bed it down properly and there you go we can snip that off and by adjusting the size of the loop you can adjust exactly what how it finishes up and what happens but there you go that's about right I like a loop about a centimeter 10 mil in diameter and you can see that's just free running and uh, unlike a, a blood knot or a grinner knot which is tight to the swivel I've just formed that loop there so it can move around more freely and the idea being it will come to to rest fairly flat on the bottom job done and that's basically all there is to the hook length I normally make these up in advance, pin them out on a rig board just so I take all of the, uh, the coiling out of the fluorocarbon um, and the same applies if you're going to use mono um, nylon inste as, instead of the fluoro. Pin them out, get them nice and straight and ready to go for when you start fishing. And then just to finish up, all we're going to do is thread the feeder onto the main line and you can use some uh, tungsten tubing up above the feeder if you want, which will just hold it a bit flatter to the bottom. It's a nice idea if you're getting a lot of line bites and uh, you know you're on the fish, so you can put some tungsten tube in there and just bring it down a little bit. But most of the time I don't really bother. And because we're tying on mono, I'm gonna go through the eye of the swivel twice. And there we go, and just tie a four turn grid or not. One, two, three, four. There we go, wet the knot as always. Carefully pull that down, tease it down. Tighten it up a little bit more. And there we go. Finish it off, nice and tight. And then we're just gonna cut off the tag end. There we are. And then that feeder will just semi-fix in there onto the swivel. So if it does get snagged up, it can pull loose but uh, it creates a really nice bolt effect just by being locked in there. And you can see when that comes to rest, that hook length can move because we've got that loop incorporated in the end. And in terms of the length of the hook length, um, for bream, I tend to tie them a little bit longer than I would for carp. Um, again, that's through experience over the years that I've found six to eight inches is about the optimal length for bream fishing rather than a shorter hook length that uh, and so you use for the perhaps smaller fish or, or carp fishing. So around eight inches is about ideal really on that. So that's the basic rig, very, very simple. So let's have a look at a few of the hook bait options that we use with this. Now, one of the problems with the method feeder is it is a bit of a crash bang wallop affair. When you cast it out, the feeder hits the water with a fair old splash, even if you are fishing to the clip, let it hit the clip and try to feather it down a little bit. It's not a subtle method. Chances are you're probably going to be fishing at a reasonable range with it, you know, anything up to about 80 yards. So again, it's going to come down and hit the water surface fairly hard. So in that situation, you really need a bait that's robust enough that it's not going to get smashed off of the hair when the feeder hits the water. Um, which obviously would be a disaster if you were fishing all night, putting the rigs out um, in the evening and expecting uh, to get a bite in, in the hours of darkness and then you wind it in the morning and find the hook baits are gone, not good. So there's a few options that we can use. Obviously we've already looked at mini boilies and a 12 mil boilie, or um, in this case a wafter, really good, works very, very well, especially on venues that have got a lot of carp anglers on and they're seeing a lot of boilies. Generally speaking, it doesn't take the bream long to realize that that's a good source of food and to start eating them. Now the other bait that I tend to use a lot is good old sweet corn but there's a little tip I can show you here and that's 
I go through very carefully through the tin of corn and look for pieces of corn that have got the whole of the, gr the grain in attached. And what I mean is if you look at the base of it, um, when they're mechanically removing the corn from the cob, most of the time that gets snapped off. But on some of the bits of corn, it's still whole and you've got the sort of bottom of the kernel on there. And so basically you've got a whole uh, intact bait, which is a lot, lot stronger. It's got a lot more integrity than a piece that's been ripped off and will stay on much, much better. Now the other thing that I tend to do if I'm using corn is I'll combine two pieces of real corn on the hair with a piece of plastic corn. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, it creates the kind of wafter again, gives you a bit of extra buoyancy, but also the plastic corn will protect the real corn when it hits the water again. So it's acting as a bit of a buffer. So what I'll do is put the artificial corn onto the needle first, then generally two pieces of real corn. I'll find myself another good bit, there's a good bit. And that'll be my hook bait, th effectively three pieces of corn, two real bits and a fake bit. And so when that's on the hair, you've basically got the fake piece of corn furthest away from the hook acting as that, that essential buffer really, that important buffer when it hits the water. Another alternative if you want to use a corn type hook bait is to swap from corn and make up a small batch of maize just for the hook. Now maize is much much tough, tougher than corn um, and I'll still generally feed corn and just fish the maize on the hook and maybe put a little bit in with my feed but um, again a good way of coming up with a much more robust hook bait. Another tactic that I'll use with the plastic corn is I'll combine it with a boilie as well. So a piece of a big piece of plastic corn and then 12 mil bottom bait, fish that onto the hair and again that will create a, a wafter kind of effect and take some of the buoyance, uh, some of the weight out of the, the rig and makes it easier for the bream to pick up because of the buoyancy in the plastic corn. You've also got a bit of extra visibility in the bright corn there as well. Again, very, very good uh, hook bait. It's caught me a lot of fish. Now the final hook bait that I tend to use with this rig is plastic casters. And a bunch of three plastic casters on the hair. Again, very, very effective. Strong enough to withstand that cast, no problem at all. And it gives you a smaller hook bait, just um, for those times when the bream are being a bit picky. And I'll often swap to a small hook bait during daylight hours when I'm not really expecting to catch a great deal, but a smaller bait can make a big difference and you often you'll pick up the odd fish, which you would have missed out on if you'd have stayed on bigger baits. So again, well worth having a packet of plastic casters with you, um, whether you're tench or bream fishing, and, and useful any time you're fishing the method and you want a small hook bait. Well, if you're fishing the method feeder, then obviously you need some ground bait to go around the feeder. And I don't worry too much about what it is. Um, I use fish meal or pellet based ground bait all the time. I'm not too worried about what brand. Um, I've used most over the years from Dynamite, Sonu Baits, Census, and all have been really effective for bream. One thing I always add is a good dollop of molasses. And by that I mean probably about a tablespoon full for uh, each pint of water that I use to mix up the ground bait. And I'm looking for really a dedicated fish mill method ground bait. Time honoured fashion is some I've prepared earlier and I like it so it binds up fairly fairly substantially and doesn't isn't going to break down too quickly and I'll talk about why that is in a second. And one thing I always do especially if I'm using a new ground bait is I'll take a separate bait tub with me, fill it with water, squeeze some ground bait around the feeder and then drop it in there and see how long it takes to break down. Don't do it in the margins because all you'll do is attract the local ducks and swans and uh, they'll be an absolute nightmare. They think you're going to feed them all the time and they won't leave you alone. So do it in a bait tub instead. And just see how long it takes the ground bait to break down and that'll give you an idea on how regularly you need to recast or, or not as the, as the case may be. And so there's the ground bait. Keep it covered up so it doesn't dry out during the course of your session. And don't make up too much. I'm only going to use the ground bait on the feeder. For loose feed or for baiting up the area, I tend these days just to use a spod um, or a spawn. 
and put out a mixture of pellets and corn, maybe some dead maggots if I've got any or casters, anything I've got left over from other sessions. Maybe some flaked up boilies as well, bits of boilie, especially if I'm fishing them on the hair. And um, the idea being that I'm feeding with bigger food items. And then in the middle is a cherry, which is this ball of ground bait, which is really, really attractive. Hopefully it'll pour the bream to it. The other thing with the underwater filming that we found with the ground bait is that once it's broken down, it's on the bottom, big fish like bream or carp moving around in the swim tend to spread it out and disperse it all over the place. So yes, it will attract them, but it won't hold them because it, it just gets moved around all over the place. So whereas the bigger baits like the crushed up boily corn, pellet will tend to stay a bit more put, they'll still get moved around a little bit, but um, um, they'll tend to stay put more and hold the fish in the swim. Now, I'm not going to put any kind of particles or feed in the ground bait, it's just fine ground bait. I try to get rid of as much of the lumps as possible, and again, there's a good reason for that. And what I do is just mould it around the feeder. I like it to be fairly sticky. Like I say, I test it beforehand to make sure it's going to break down in, in the right amount of time. And that depends on how long I'm expecting the feeders to be out for. If I'm night fishing, it could be that I cast out in the evening and only make one or two more casts during the night. So I want it to break down pretty slowly. And to do that, I'll make it slightly damper and really pack it onto the feeder. And what I'm looking for is enough ground bait really to just cover the feeder, but I can still see, if you can see that there, the end of the veins, because that tells me the two thicker ones have got the lead in, so it's going to land that way up with a thinner vein on top. And then what I'll do is just fold the hook length back and just pop it the hook into the top like that. And that will eliminate, in 99% of cases, I'm not going to say 100%, any kind of tangles. And it will go out really, really nice, come to land on the bottom, the right way up, and the ground bait will slowly dissolve and uh, give you that little patch of bait with hook bait in the middle. Now the reason that I haven't put any um, bigger baits like corn or pellets or anything like that, bits of boilie, in the ground bait is because I don't want anything at all in there to mask that hook point. The last thing I want when I push that hook into it, into the ground bait, is a chance of it getting caught on something and the hook point getting masked. Because then you'll get a bite, the hook won't set, and um, you've missed your chance. So again, it's a small detail, but over the years, you know, I found that two or three times, you know, I didn't catch fish when I had bites because I'd wind in, there'd be a bit of boily or something over the hook point. So eliminate that little bit of doubt and just don't do it, just leave it out of that feed. And there we go, ready to go. Very uh, aerodynamic, casts really well. It's quite heavy, like I say, so be careful on the cast, but works very, very effectively. Um, test the ground bait, see how long it takes to break down, and you won't go far wrong. Again, like all things about method fishing, very, very simple, and the more, more simple, if that's a word, that you can keep it, the better. Well, there you go. The method feeder is a really simple tactic that's been around for a long time now. But don't forget, it's very, very effective and it's easy to move on to the latest fashionable rig and forget about ones that uh, are equally, if not more, successful. So give the method a go when you're out bream fishing. It works very, very well. It's caught me a lot of big fish over the years from a lot of different venues. It's very, very effective. So I hope this video has been useful for you. Hopefully we'll see you again soon. And thanks again for watching. Cheers for now.